Jesus is being a rebel in this coming Sunday's gospel reading from Matthew chapter 21. As he often does, he's being rebellious against those who are his detractors. They're trying to force him to answer a question, and he responds with a question of his own. And he follows that up with a very in-your-face kind of parable that's unique to the gospel of Matthew, but has a certain affinity with the parable of the prodigal son. And then at the end of this particular reading, he matches together two groups of people that we don't hear match in any other part of the Gospels, the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Now, what's going on there? What connection might tax collectors have with prostitutes? Well, we will see. Let's begin by kind of setting the stage here. Let me read to you the opening verse of this section of Matthew 21. It says, and when Jesus entered the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority, the Greek there would be exousia, by what exousia are you doing these things, and who gave you this exousia? Now keep in mind the context in which this is happening in Matthew chapter 21. We are not in Holy Week right now, but these events took place during Holy Week, which of course was a very intense week in the ministry of Jesus. What's happened? He rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He was acclaimed by the crowds to be the son of David, the Messiah. And then he went to the temple. He cleansed the temple, overturning the tables of the money changers. These events would, of course, have repercussions. There would have been reverberations throughout the city of Jerusalem based upon what Jesus had done. All that's happened, and now Jesus enters into Jerusalem, into the very temple that he had cleansed the day before, and this is when he begins to teach. So you can see why the religious authorities, the religious superstars of the day, were determined that it was time to shut Jesus down, to shut him up, and to get rid of him, no matter what it take. No matter what it takes, they had to stop him from influencing the crowds, from becoming the one that they were listening to, the one that they were following, because they were afraid that their own power, religious power structure was going to be demolished if the activity of Jesus was allowed to continue. So they come up to Jesus, two different groups, the chief priests and the elders of the people, and they say, by what authority are you doing these things? Now, I don't think that they really were looking for an answer to their question. If they really wanted to know by what authority Jesus did what he did, they could have listened to him because he's told us multiple times. His authority came from his father. His authority came from God. What his father said, he said. What his father did, he did. That was where his authority came from. So they want to know basically, why are you doing what you're doing? But more importantly, they want him to stop, to get out, to stop his teaching. They are united, by the way, these two different groups, the chief priests and the elders, as we often see various groups coming together, united in opposition to Jesus. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Pharisees and the scribes, here the chief priests and the elders. I think this is the evangelist's way of indicating that there was a mounting opposition to Jesus. All these various factions of Judaism were united against this one they opposed. Well, what does Jesus say to them? What kind of answer is he going to give to them? Here's what he says. He says, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. From where did it come? From heaven or from man? Now keep in mind that as is often the case in the Gospels, heaven is just a substitute for the name of God. So when Jesus says from heaven, he means from God. Just like the phrase kingdom of heaven means kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying, did John's authority come from God or from man? In other words, notice what he's doing. He's turning the tables on them. He is saying, oh, you ask me about my authority, by what authority I'm doing these things? Well, let me ask you about the authority of John. The authority of John to baptize in the Jordan. The authority of John to preach a baptism of repentance. Where did John get his authority? Did it come from God, from heaven, or did it come from man? So Jesus, being the rebel that he is, is not going to let them set the rules of engagement. He's going to push back against them. He's going to set them on their heels, as, of course, he often does. Okay, what kind of answer are they going to come up with? Well, let's listen to the dialogue that they have one with another. They discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, well, he'll say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, 
were afraid of the crowd because they all, all hold that John was a prophet. Now, notice that their weak-willed and politically calculating dialogue betrays the fact that they are moral cowards, not to mention theological cowards. They're not interested in, in saying boldly and forthrightly and honestly what they believe to be the truth from God. They're interested in saying that which is going to save their own skin. They're interested in responding to that which is politically expedient. Their response is based upon fear of the people or fear of Jesus' response to them. And I tell you, anytime that a theologian says what he says based upon fear of the people, he's being a coward. He's not being a theologian. He's not being the teacher of the scriptures. So these chief priests and these elders, they're not interested in engaging in honest dialogue. They're not honest interlocutors. Instead, they're only interested in saying that which is going to help them. And notice too, that they are no better than Herod because Herod believed, Herod was afraid of the people too, right? That's why he didn't want to do anything to John because the people held that John was a prophet. Same thing here. They are afraid of the people because the people held that John was a prophet. So Herod, the chief priest and the elders are really all in this same kind of group with regard to the truth. Okay, well, what kind of answer are they going to give? That's what we read next. They answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. In other words, Jesus says, since you've given me a non-answer, I'm going to give you no answer. They lied to him. They weren't forthright. They weren't honest. And so Jesus is not going to give them an answer to their question as well. But he's not done. He's about to tell them a parable, which, as I mentioned, is a very in-your-face kind of parable, which indicts them for not doing the will of the Father who is in heaven. Here's how the parable goes. It's very short. Let me read it to you. He says, what do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but he did not. Now, this parable, even though it's not like the parable of the prodigal son, does have a certain family resemblance to it, right? Because in both you have two sons, two brothers. And so the, the no, then yes son in this parable would correspond to the younger prodigal son in the Gospel of Luke. And then the yes, then no son in this parable would correspond to the older brother in the Gospel of Luke. And of course, as you probably realize, the story of two sons or two brothers is an archetypical way of telling stories. Philo, who was the first century Jewish philosopher in Egypt, he held that, probably rightly so, he held that all of these stories of brothers or two sons go back to the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. We have multiple Bible stories about two brothers, two sons, right? Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, we have Jacob and Esau. We have Moses and Aaron. But it's not just in the scriptures. But we also have this in other ancient literature. Of course, we have the story of Remus and Romulus, right? The two brothers, Romulus being the one who found the legendary founder of the city of Rome. And we still have this in books and cinema today. Just think, for instance, from the Lion King of Mufasa and Scar, the two brothers. Or think of, of Thor and Loki, right? So this, this is an archetypical way of telling a story that Jesus engages in here. You have two brothers who characterize two different groups of people. They are archetypes of two different groups. Well, what are the two groups like? Well, there's the one who says no and then later changes his mind, regrets his decision, and says yes. Interesting Greek verb that's used here. It's metamelomai. It's not the typical, typical word for repent in the New Testament. Instead, metamelomai simply means to have sorrow over something, to regret a decision that one has made. So it's used two times in this particular reading. But it's also, interestingly, it's the, it's the verb that's used to describe the sorrow of Judas Iscariot after he had betrayed Jesus. Metamelomai. He, he experienced regret. He experienced sorrow over that which he had done and the the ramifications of his of his action. Keep in mind, there's a, there's a big difference between regret and repentance. There's a big difference between having sorrow and being repentant. 
because everyone is sorrowful over something they've done, right? Everyone experiences regret, but not everyone experiences repentance. So there's regret and then there's repentance. Repentance is much more closely aligned to faith or trust because repentance is not just feeling sorry, it's not just having regret, but more importantly, much much more importantly, it is believing that God in Christ has forgiven you. That's what true repentance looks like. So in this particular case, all he's talking about here is, is sorrow, right? He says no, and then he, he regrets that decision that he made. And so he later goes and works in the vineyard. But the other brother, he lies. He's just like the chief priest and the elders. He says one thing with his mouth, but his heart is in a completely different place. He says, yeah, sure, dad, I'll go work in the vineyard. But he doesn't because he's not telling the truth. And so he is the one who doesn't do the will of the father. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's see how Jesus applies this particular parable. He goes on to say, to ask really, which of the two did the will of his father? So you notice he begins with a question, right? He says, uh, what do you think, right? Then he tells the parable. And then after the parable, he has another question. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds. That's that the Greek verb again, metamelamai. You did not change your minds and believe him. So the issue really here is this. Which of the two did the will of the Father? And what is the will of the Father? This is not about works. This is about believing. Which of the two truly believed the Father? Because that is what the will of the Father is, right? We read this explicitly in the Gospel of John. John chapter 6, verse 40 says this, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. The will of the Father is that we believe and have eternal life. So that's what the tax collectors and the prostitutes were doing. They were believing, and thus they were entering into eternal life. But the chief priests and the elders of the people were not. They were not doing the will of the Father because they, all they were interested in were lies. They weren't interested in the truth. They were not interested in believing and doing the will of the Father. And so they correspond to that particular son in the parable. Now, let's talk for a second about this pairing of the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Usually in the Gospels, we're used to what? Hearing about the tax collectors and the sinners, right? This is the only time when you have tax collectors paired with prostitutes. What connection might these groups have? Well, I think it's this. We all know that tax collectors were Jews who had basically stabbed their people in the back because they had collaborated with the Roman authorities to collect taxes from the Jewish people. That's why they were hated so much. But what about the prostitutes? Well, the prostitutes, just like the tax collectors, they were, they were Jewish. This was Judea. So these Jewish prostitutes, they probably were those who were uh, uh, hired by Roman soldiers. And so the Roman soldiers hired the Jewish prostitutes. And therefore, these Jewish prostitutes were also seen as collaborating with Rome because they were connected with the Roman soldiers. So just like the tax collectors were connected with Rome, collaborating with Rome, thus hated, so these Jewish prostitutes were seen as collaborating with Rome because they were, uh, they were being engaged, they were being uh, uh, bought by the Roman soldiers for uh, sexual purposes. So that's probably why these two particular groups are joined, joined together here. But this group, the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they were believing, they were following, they were actually doing the will of the Father. It was not about moral improvement, it was about them believing in the one that God had sent. So they, by faith, followed the will of the Father, as opposed to the chief priest and the elders of the people who rejected both John as well as Jesus. So in this particular parable, Jesus is saying, listen, the tax collectors who were hated, and the Jewish prostitutes, who of course were considered to be unclean, Jesus elevates them above the religious authorities of the day. Because in the end, it's all about faith. It's all about whether you do the will of your father by believing in the Messiah and having eternal life. So 
This is all going to be followed ne the next time by another parable in which we understand how the intensity is increasing. This, this intense rejection of Jesus is increasing as he will talk about the, the parable of the son of the vineyard owner who's cast out and killed. But we'll get to that next week. Thanks for watching. I pray that it has uh, illumined this gospel reading and that it will be a blessing to you as you preach on it or as you hear it preached in your, in your churches. I hope that you all are doing well and I pray God's abundant peace in Jesus Christ upon each of you. Thank you for watching.